Priceless. People of Scotland were wonderful, but I didn't. This is way beyond wonderful, so I really appreciate it so much. Um, I come from, uh, live now in um, Rockport, Massachusetts, uh, Cape Ann, and uh, invite all of you to come visit sometime. It's a nice tourist area. Um, okay. This is what I'm going to talk about this morning. Um, first, talk a little bit about the importance of the ceiling jet for detected detection and activation of uh, suppression devices. Uh, the basis for the formulas that were first published in 1972. Um, and uh, then, um, take a little more modern look at those, at the data that are the underpinnings of that, those formulas. Uh, maybe my objective really is to, um, so that you, uh, no one will have to use those formulas anymore. Um, I, I'm hoping that there'll be some, some more uh, modern work um, because I get a little depressed every time I see uh, those formulas mentioned in the literature. Um, I was in, in, 19, in 2003, I was in the library at FM and uh, saw a title, uh, something about the ceiling jet, and I was, it was from Japan, and I was saying, oh, this is going to be something new, something entirely new. And uh, I was really interested, and I started reading the abstract, and I saw my name in the abstract. And that was uh, very depressing. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so I'm hoping that when I show you um, how this formula speaks to being, uh, you'll understand uh, why I feel that way. Um, anyway, uh, I re-examined some, uh, some of the data that I still have available and looked at the most reliable uh, part of that data and um, to see um, if we can come up with um, uh, a new regression fit, uh, a new formula, so to speak, for the ceiling jet as far as velocity and temperature are concerned and uh, see where that leads us. Um, then I wanted to look at some of the uh, work that I had done um, in the early 1980s. On, uh, now that you, uh, uh, you can predict when the ceiling jet will activate a suppression device, now how is that water going to interact with the fire? And especially you want to know how much the water is going to get to the fire, how many devices ultimately are going to be activated. And uh, because that's, that tells you uh, what the total flow rate of uh, extinguishing agent you're going to have to provide. And so that's very important. So I did some um, CFD modeling of that back in 1980, in the early 1980s, and we'll see um, what that looks like. Um, I was trying to inspire some people to, to do some more of that work, and uh, it took a while um, before that happened. And finally, um, just briefly looking at uh, how much of the agent flux you actually need to arrive at the fire in order to suppress it, in order to control it. Um, now that you know the interaction studies tell you um, how much water is going to, or a agent is going to arrive near the fire, and now what is actually required uh, to control the fire, and there's an interesting way of determining that. Uh, with uh, measuring the flame heat transfer. So that's some work that I did in the um, early 2000s. So we'll, we'll look at that. Now, the ceiling jet flow itself, the ceiling jet, uh, show you a little um, schematic, but this uh, relatively thin flow near the ceiling, uh, fast moving compared to the rest of the hot gas layer. Um, that flow is going to determine when the device, the ceiling mounted device is going to activate, whether it's a sprinkler or a fire detector or a smoke detector or whatever. So it's important from that aspect. Um, and um, 
very important that's sometimes overlooked is we, we have to know how many devices ultimately are going to be activated as a result of the total interaction with the fire. Um, and the, the ceiling jet uh, ultimately will flow the velocity and temperature and the thickness of the jet will determine how many of those devices ultimately are activated. Um, and um, that determines how much maximum flow agent. If you don't have a system that can provide that flow, then the flow from each device is going to be far below what it was designed for, and uh, the whole system will collapse. You won't be able to control the fire. So, um, so that's very important. And of course, the ceiling jet can ultimately cause damage to the ceiling surface um, due to ignition if it's not a, uh, if it's not a, if it's a combustible surface, and uh, or structural failure even if it isn't combustible. So the ceiling jet itself does certainly have significance. Okay, so this is the basically the problem that I worked at uh, beginning in uh, 1969, actually, when I first came to FM a long time ago. Um, and uh, the, um, this is the, when I was the first started to develop a model of the ceiling jet, this is the control volume that I was working on, looking at the forces that were involved. Um, and doing a force balance and coming up with an integral model for the velocity and temperature, and, uh, and actually developed that model in 1971. We put it into a, a, a factory mutual technical report in 1971, and in those days they distributed the technical reports um, all over the world, and, and that one was. And uh, so uh, everyone got to know about the results uh, way before it was formally published ultimately in 1975. So we have the plume, we have a fire source here of some kind, and, um, and plume, and a, a half Gaussian flow or Gaussian flow, we assume uh, for the plume, and uh, the turning region here. Um, for the ceiling jet model, we made a very, very simple assumption that the, the maximum velocity in plume just turned and became the maximum velocity in the ceiling jet, and later work done here, at Edinburgh showed that isn't a very good approximation, um, that there's a, a lot of energy lost in that turning, but um, still that's the, the assumption that was made in the original uh, model. And there's a, of course, there's a small uh, distance here below the ceiling where uh, you have some drag from the ceiling, the boundary layer of the ceiling. Uh, so the maximum velocity is somewhat below the ceiling, depending on the, the overall scale of the problem, but um, so it's in many of the measurements I'll be talking about, um, because they were on such a large scale, we weren't able to do a pro careful profile and to determine exactly where the maximum velocity and temperature were. Um, so when I say maximum velocity or maximum excess temperature, you take that with a grain of salt uh, because we didn't determine exactly where that was. Okay, so that's basically the problem I'm going to be talking about. And the, um, the, as I mentioned, this, this model was put together and distributed in, in 1971. Um, the, uh, there were, ultimately, um, after I did that, there were one or just very, very few data points that I had from large-scale tests, more than a, a few meters um, in ceiling height. And, uh, that were in the original report that was distributed in 71. Um, but, uh, so the, we looked for, to do a, a additional, get some additional uh, full scale data. And of course, there were always fire tests going on at FM, large scale fire tests and fire tests uh, near the Rhode Island, Connecticut border. And um, there were the order of 10, 10 or 20 meters scale. And, uh, so we put to try and look at those analyzed data from all those tests and put that together and assemble it and um, guided by the parameters from the model or just simple um, uh, scale modeling and um, dimensional analysis. And um, I was urged at that time, um, you know, you've got to get that information out to the uh, engineering uh, community. 
as, as soon as you can. So in 1972, there was a, a National Fire Protection Association meeting, I forget where, and, um, and I uh, presented during that meeting just four of those formulas with no data whatsoever <laughs> to support them. Just put out those formulas and, um, and everyone seemed to just, uh, it seemed to be a revelation for people, but because they were, uh, I guess they were waiting for something like that. I must have gotten 50 or 100 business cards after that talk um, <laughs> given to me. And, uh, and then later that same year, it was published in Fire Technology. Again, <coughs> no backup data, no nothing, just the formulas. Um, I would never think of doing that now, nowadays. And, uh, but back then, that was, you know, I guess that, um, anything you did that, like it was, anything you did at that time was groundbreaking. I guess we can put it that way. So, um, so that went out. So let me show you um, what actually happened here. In the, um, these are the formulas that were originally published. These are in SI units, uh, kilowatts and uh, meters. And uh, this is the formula for the maximum sealage velocity, radial outward velocity in the ceiling. Um, and the uh, formula is valid up until the beginning where the, the turning region ends. And that's uh, the radius over ceiling height of, um, being greater than 0.15 for that formula. And um, Q dot here is the actual heat release rate of the fire. I mean, at that time, we didn't know exactly what the actual heat release rate of the fire was, we kind of guessing, but um, from mass loss data. Um, and uh, even though now we know that the velocity is controlled by the convective component of the heat release rate, but at that time, we, we were just using the actual heat release rate. And here is the... Um, Here's the data that I was using at that time um, that I'd assembled. Um, and it, it covers a range of, of flame heights here where the, um, the, 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 the model actually only is in this situation. The flame is a very small fraction of the ceiling height. Uh, but I looked also at data where even the flame was, was impinging on the ceiling. And, um, and uh, so as far as the model was concerned, the model assumed that there was a point source of ignition, a point source fire uh, for the plume. Um, but this was just a going to be correlation, so I wasn't too concerned about that. So you can see there's, a, there's some scatter of data here, and the, the formula is, the, is this dashed line, the dashed red line. And we see there's a number of different experiments that I'll be, some of these I'll be talking much more about. There's a, a heptane um, spray fire, I think this is. Um, and these are in English units because this is way back in the beginning. Um, and an ethanol pool fire, um, which is quite good because it's very little radiation. Um, and then there's, a, these are small scale fires, um, laboratory scale fires um, with a methane burner. So this is the type of data that I was taking a look at, and I just drew a line. That's just a, a line that was drawn by I. I didn't do a regression fit. We didn't have laptop computer, any kind of computer in the office then. So um, uh, I just drew a line. So that's, that's the formula, and that's the type of data that I was uh, looking at, for velocity at least. Um, for temperature, we had a lot more data because it was easier to take. I think these velocity measurements were probably made with hot wire anemometers. There were no bidirectional flow probes then. Um, so hot wire anemometers, and you had to calibrate them carefully and compensate for the temperature, the gas temperature. And, it was a, and of course, the wire could get soot on it. It was a very messy business. Um, but in any case, that's the, that's the data that we had. And this is the... Um, the formula that I came up with for the uh, excess gas temperature. And um, uh, the, again, the, uh, the actual heat release rate of the fire. And uh, for this, the uh, turning region for temperature begins at uh, R of H greater than 0.18. So the, the, the data that we had to support this that fire technology article is this kind of mess here. Um, 
as I said, there's much more temperature data. And uh, perhaps if people had seen this in the original article, they wouldn't have latched onto that formula <laughs> as much as they did. But um, you can see, again, I just drew a line through the data. And, um, and there's all kinds of, uh, again, you have some spray, uh, peptine spray nozzles on a, a 12 foot circle. And uh, this is polystyrene um, in boxes. It's uh, compartments of cartons with polystyrene cups inside the compartments. Um, and this says PVC, but um, I've gone back and looked at that actual test uh, from another study and then found that it really wasn't PVC, it was polyethylene. Uh, but anyway, um, PVC, when you burn it in that test center, would cause all kinds of corrosion. And I, I doubted that it was PVC, but I went back and looked at the test and indeed it wasn't. Anyway, this is just cartons alone, the cardboard cartons alone on pallets. And this is some, some other polyethylene in them, compartmented. And this is uh, wood pallets, just wood pallets alone. Um, 2.4 meters high, eight feet high. And, um, and again, um, the ethanol pool fire. And uh, now this is a corner test. And for the corner <coughs> test, I think I multiplied the heat release rate by four, assuming the fire was in good contact with the walls and then using the um, symmetry arguments, you can show that you should multiply the heat release rate by four when you put it in this correlation. And uh, again, these are these small scale uh, laboratory fires. So there's quite a, a mass of data there and um, a lot of scatter. And of course, you have a huge range where the flames are actually impinging on the ceiling here. And here they're more reasonable, well below the ceiling. So you have this uh, all different kinds of data. And I just drew a line through it. So. Um, well, we'll see if we can do something better than that. So as I say, it was a qualitative curve fit um, for both full scale and model tests. And um, some of that data are still available. I have it in my files. I happen to have it in my files. And I happen to have analyzed it, fortunately, for the fourth edition of the um, SFP handbook. So I have looked at it and, um, and um, so that, this talk gives me an opportunity to look over that, that data again and, and see where I can take it. And so I wanted to look at, the, for the data that I still had available, and uh, could analyze, do a regression fit, and see, compare it to the original formulas and see what kind of results we came out with. So I thought that would be interesting. Um, and these are the data that I had available. Um, and. Uh, Sorry about that. I don't know that. Um, I, uh, there's a reference number there. Anyway, um, just for reference sake, this is the, the net heat of complete of combustion, net heat of complete combustion that you can find in the handbook for each of these uh, fuels. And uh, this is the actual value of the uh, heat of combustion that was used back in, the, in 1971 or 72. And um, so, uh, I mean, fortunately, these are all less than or equal to, to this, so that's that's good. Um, and for the heptane sprays, I just took the that heat completed combustion, assuming the spray was atomized, that it was it was you know, pretty good combustion. So this is the pool fire and the uh, wood pallet stack and the polyethylene bottles, compartment boxes. That's one that had been said PVC originally, and polystyrene jars and carton boxes, and the heptane sprays, um, spray nozzles, I forget how many, uh, on, a, on a 12 foot circle or something like that. Kind of um, facing inward at a 45 degree angle to form a, a fire film. So this is the, uh, these are the types of fuels that were, that were being analyzed again, and um, and these are then the fire source conditions based on those uh, heats of combustion. These are the fire source conditions. The, um, um, for these three here, this is the height of the stack uh, of fuel, the you know, height of the pallets and the height of the boxes. There's the, these boxes are each on a, 
are stacked on pallets, so the pallets are on top of boxes that are on pallets. But the, uh, the heap of these rate is calculated ignoring the pallets. The pallets really, the wood pallets don't get involved, it's just mainly the cardboard. So this affected the fuel diameter um, <coughs> that we used and the, um, the ceiling height above the top of the fuel surface. That's what was used in the original correlation, was that ceiling height above the top of the fuel. Um, rather than looking at any kind of virtual point source, which I'll look at in a moment. And, um, and then this is the, the fuel mass flow rate. Um, in the case of the uh, heptane sprays, we, the fuel mass flow rate was measured, so we know that, and coupling that with the heat of combustion, we, we get the heat release rate. And for these others, it's a mass loss rate that you have to obtain. And so based on that, you have a total heat release rate. Um, based on the net heat of complete combustion or the actual heat release rate. So these are the numbers that I used uh, to re-examine uh, the correlation, basically, this last count, the count of heat release rate. And um, <coughs> instead of using a dimensionless uh, ordinance as I did in those first two uh, slides with all the data, uh, that was dimensionless and using dimensional coordinates here with the meters per second and meters and, and kilowatts for heat release rate. And the, the dimensional analysis or the model suggests that uh, the velocity times the um, ceiling, the ceiling height to the one third power divided by the heat release rate to the one third power is, is the parameter that you should. It's just dependent on uh, the ratio of the radius to ceiling height. So that's what we're looking at with that, these data. And um, so this is, the, this is what we come up with, just looking at, at, those, at those data. Um, the, uh, the ethanol pool fire, the diamonds, the wood pallet fire, the squares, and the heptane spray fire to the triangle. And um, if we just want to fit the, the ethanol pool fire data alone, which is probably the most reliable, that's the, the fit that you get. And um, with a recently good regression coefficient. And this is just the ceiling jet velocity. So that's, that's a pretty good fit. And, um, but we can uh, now compare that. If we take all that data together, together and look at the original formula, we see there, there's a bit of a difference. And uh, the original formula, I think, had some Five six power of the of R over H. I think I was I was looking for a, to get a nice even rational number at that time. Maybe that's why um, that velocity is off. But um, anyway, this is the original formula, and this is this um, looking at the uh, little more reliable data and the regression fit. That's the fit you have now. So it's it's certainly a, a difference, not a huge difference, but there certainly is a difference. Um, and uh, but we have R over H here to the basically minus one power, uh, which is very similar to what we originally had. But anyway, so that certainly is a difference. And now looking at um, excess ceiling jet temperature, um, again, this is the, the dimensional analysis or the model would suggest that you should plot the data this way. Looking at the, the, the uh, temperature difference, <coughs> it's the ceiling height to the 5 thirds power divided by heat release rate to two-thirds power, that's some kilowatts. So that's, what I, that's the uh, ordinate that I'm using in this plot here. And um, well, we can see there's still quite a bit of scatter. Um, the heptane spray fires, um, the, uh, these starting at just the fire A here, the heptane spray has the lowest heat release rate and the um, greatest ceiling height. So you would, um, this is more like a, a, a small fire source with a big ceiling, whereas uh, E and F here, the, the flames are, are getting toward the ceiling. So you'd, uh, um, anyway, where the flames are very large, you'd expect to be away from the correlation. Indeed, that's true. Um, and uh, the, uh, these other um, the data points, um, you're, of course, compared to heptane and the um, ethanol, 
the, the burning rate, the, the heat release rate for these other fires is less certain. You, you don't know exactly what the, the heat of combustion is for this complicated commodity with uh, plastic and cardboard cartons. Um, but we uh, did the best we could to estimate that. So this is the fit, the um, fit to just the uh, ethanol pool fire, which is probably the most reliable. That type of formula with a pretty good regression coefficient. And now comparing that to the original ceiling jet formula, you see that that's it's pretty good um, by coincidence. Perhaps. But the dot line is the original um, fire technology formula, and, was, uh, and the solid line is the regression fits all of the data uh, there. Um, and so as far as excess temperature goes, the original formula is probably pretty good, um, reasonably reliable. There's just a small difference there. And um, so um, what I wanted to do with, for this um, SFB handbook and what I'm going to talk about now is, is doing, um, trying to improve that correlation. And, um, First of all, just use data for the ethanol pool fires and the, and the heptane spray fire sources where we know the heat release rate um, pretty reliably. And um, because you can measure the uh, mass loss rate and, and, you, and it's a well-defined source. And then uh, the next step is use the ceiling height above the virtual, virtual emergent. Um, the, the, um, the original uh, model and uh, Dimensional analysis really referred to a point source, uh, point fire source, and uh, so let's see where the virtual for these two uh, fires, the pool fire, the ethane spray fire, you can calculate um, where the virtual origin is instead of using the fuel surface or the actual nozzle elevation itself. And so we use that as our height uh, basis. And then, of course, the convective component of heat release rate instead of the total heat release rate. Um, because it's the convective component of the heat release rate that determines the velocity and temperature in the ceiling jet. Um, and, uh, and see what the, using that um, convective component uh, makes a difference in the correlation. So the, uh, this is the formula for the virtual origin that was developed by Gunnar Huskestad. And, um, and uh, depends on the heat release rate to the two fifths power. Now this is not the convective component. This is the, the actual chemical heat release rate of the fire. Because it, this is related, this virtual origin is related to the flame height. And, and the flame height is determined by the actual heat release rate, not just the convective component. And here we have the effective diameter the scale of the fire source. So um, if you have a very large fire source, it makes the virtual origin um, go below the actual um, location of the fire. Um, and then if you have a very high heat release rate, it elevates the virtual origin. So you have these competing effects. And, um, and for this formula, um, Gunnar Heska said determined that the, you should measure um, height from the, uh, the lowest elevation in which you have burning. I mean, in this case, it doesn't matter. We have a pool fire. We have um, spray fire. But um, if you have a pile of boxes, um, you would measure the or origin from the point lowest elevation of the uh, where there are flames. So this is the formula I used for the virtual origin of the plume, and these are the fuels again. Um, the two fuels, the ethanol pool and the heptane spray, and um, this is the convective heat of combustion uh, determined from Tuarsen's uh, handbook value. Um, it was measured in the laboratory. Um, so there's, of course, uncertainty in those, in those cases. There's very, very different ways um, of measuring uh, the uh, convective component of heat release rate. You can use a large-scale calorimeter in a test building to measure it. But um, this, this is what's uh, it actually in the handbook. So I use those values for the convective heat release rate. And so now this is the fire sources for the, um, the ethanol pool, um, about a meter diameter, and these different um, 
heptane sprays with the different heptane flow rates. And um, here's the mass flow, and we, we can calculate from that the, the actual heat release rate. And then, based on that actual heat release rate, we can calculate the virtual origin position. And you see for the heptane pool, the virtual origin is slightly below the surface of the heptane and uh, of the ethanol, I'm sorry, and for these sprays, um, again, it's below the level of the nozzles. But as the heat release rate increases, um, as the flow rate of heptane increases, you can get a virtual origin above the, above the nozzles. So, um, and this gives you, this is the, the uh, distance between the ceiling and the position of the virtual <coughs> origin as calculated. So this is the, act, the ceiling height that is used, proposing to use in the formula instead of the actual ceiling height of the fuel surface. And here's the convective heat release rate based on that fuel flow rate and the, and the convective component of the heat of combustion. So this is the, the data now that I'm um, re-examining. And the, uh, again, the uh, ordinate gives this uh, velocity times the length scale for one third over the heat release rate for one third. Only this time, the length scale, instead of being the ceiling height, is the difference between the uh, ceiling height and the virtual origin position. So it's the ceiling height above the virtual origin that I'm plotting. So now we have um, new correlation for velocity, and uh, and uh, it's pretty pretty tight correlation. The, uh, the uh, regression coefficient is pretty good for the ethanol alone, and for, for both of them, it's also not not as good, but pretty good. Um, so including both the heptane spray and the ethanol fuel fires, we have this, the, the dash line is the fit for all the data. So um, basically that would be the new uh, ceiling jet uh, formula that I would think would be much more reliable than the original one for the um, ceiling jet velocity. And um, again, the ordinate for the excess temperature, where instead of using the ceiling height to five thirds, we're using this the, the height of the ceiling above the virtual origin, the virtual plume origin to the five thirds, and the convective component of heat release rate. And again, we get um, a much better correlation than we had before. Um, uh, and it really brings the, uh, the heptane data, heptane spray data, onto the, um, closer to the regression fit. You know, it's a much better regression fit than we had before. So um, this is certainly a little more satisfying, and that's the, um, the fit to both for, for all of the data, the, uh, both the uh, heptane and the ethanol data. And uh, so again, we have a new formula for the um, excess ceiling jet temperature. And, uh, but, um, <coughs> so I'm proposing that that be used instead of the original formulas. Um, and so here's the, um, the new regression fit um, from, re well, re as a result of this re-examination, the velocity data we have the, uh, the uh, radius, non-dimensional radius to the minus 1.074 power. And we have a re uh, regression coefficient of 0.972, uh, which isn't too bad. So that's the new velocity formula and the new excess temperature formula. Regression fit, not quite as good, but 0.96 isn't too bad. Certainly much better than the original um, mass data we had. So that's the, the formulas that we're Proposing that. Um, so that's the re-examination of the ceiling jet formulas, and um, so now that you know um, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, details, the dirty details behind those original formulas, um, you can forget about them.
and go on to something new and better, hopefully. Um, so that was the work that I did in the early 1970s. Then in, uh, the late, in, in early 1980s, beginning of 1980, I wanted to see, well, you know, now that we know that the spray device or detector is activated, what's going to happen to that water? How is it going to get to the fire? How is it going to interact with the fire? The very, very small droplets maybe will get blown away by the plume and, um, and deflected. And the large droplets, very large droplets, could change the fire plume themselves. They're going to be, uh, have a strong momentum and could get right through the plume and perhaps modify the plume. So you know, it was really interesting to figure out. But unfortunately, we had very little computing power back then, so it was kind of frustrating. And, um, but beginning in 1980, I began to look at just the spray alone. What was the flow induced by the spray alone? A sprinkler spray all by itself. And, um, and it's going to induce a, induce a flow and kind of form a floor jet. Air is going to be forced down to the floor of a jet. And that would uh, determine what um, mass flux that you would measure um, at the floor if you had pans set up for the sprinklers. And, and so uh, I tried to predict that and actually um, published something in 1980 or 81 at the American Society of Mechanical Engineers at the um, so the objective here is to predict the suppression effectiveness once you have that spray uh, device activated. And um, it was just looking at a very simple uh, axisymmetric geometry where the spray was directly above the fire uh, to reduce the computing time, obviously, so we didn't have a 3D problem. But it turns out that's a very challenging problem all by itself, to spray directly above the fire. And in some cases now, they do large-scale tests with the spray directly above the fire to see how it's going to be behave, because it is so challenging. So, but that's the simple geometry I was using. And um, to do that, we were using uh, one of Spalding's, the Spalding's Teach program was available then, and that had been modified uh, by Professor Clayton Crow at Washington State University in the US. And uh, so we, we, uh, we started using that. Um, so you have an Eulerian gas solution using the Teach CFD for the gas phase, and Lagrangian droplet tracking, tracking the droplets. Um, uh, once you had that gas solution, you track the droplets through it. And of course, you have mass momentum and energy transfer between the gas and the droplets in each cell, in each computational cell. So the droplets go through and they deposit mass momentum and energy in the cell. And based on those sources, you run the gas calculation for several iterations. And this is, this is a steady state program. So you're just iterating to converge, <coughs> to get some kind of convergence, and then you repeat the whole thing all over again. And, uh, and it takes a long time, and you finally, hopefully, get the converged solution. Um, so that's the kind of thing I was doing back then. And um, this is the uh, schematic of that. We actually had a, a finite heat release zone um, for my uh, certain number of computational cells and had a certain uh, amount of energy released per unit volume in each of those cells, which was comparable to what we saw in actual fires. And depending on the heat release rate, this would either be a very large zone or a very small zone. Um, and uh, there's the plume, and then we had a point droplet source, and of course then the challenge is um, to how are you going to simulate a sprinkler? And I used uh, a certain number of trajectories, five or ten different trajectories, five or ten different drop sizes, um, depending on the calculation, to simulate a uh, sprinkler. And we knew so from um, measurements that have been done with real sprinklers, uh, measuring the momentum, uh, the force, uh, the reaction force on the spray, you can infer what the effective injection velocity is of the droplets. Um, what their the total momentum should be. So um, that's the injection velocity we use based on that experimental measurement. We didn't have uh, Louise's measurements available back then, but the detailed measurements she was doing in the laboratory with the droplets um, properties, and that would have been nice to have. But anyway, um, so this is the, 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 um, the uh, computational domain we were using. We have an open boundary here where we just have a um, 
constant pressure and um, zero vorticity, I think, coming in for the inflow and constant vorticity going out. So those are the basic boundary conditions. And the first thing we wanted to do was see if this had any reliability at all, uh, validity at all. So we compared just without a spray, we just the, um, the gas flow alone, and uh, looking at the ceiling jet, the velocity near the ceiling in this flow, um, this is what the numerical solution gave, this dot, dot, dash line here, small dash line. And uh, this is some data measurements that have been made in the laboratory. Um, this is a temperature measurement. So we have some delta T measurements here. And this is what the, uh, the CFD measurements predicted. And um, this is what the, um, the uh, ceiling jet numerical solution gave us. This is from the model, the ceiling jet model. So they were basically the, the CFD measurements were aligned reasonably well with the data and the models. So we had some confidence to proceed and put and add in a, a spray. Um, we also did some measurements, uh, did some computations where there was no fire at all, as I mentioned, just the spray. And we wanted to look at um, the variation of water flux um, at, the, at the floor level, basically. Uh, how that varied the distance from the, from the axis of the spray. And, uh, and the, um, this is the, uh, the, the calculations and these are the measurements that were made of how the, the water flux varied with radius. And um, I don't know uh, how, how good that is, but at least that's something we attempted to do to see how reliable the calculation was. So then we did uh, both together, the spray interacting with the plume. And uh, of course, you can take these with a grain of salt, um, you know, because you have uh, a finite cell size here. Um, and uh, but we wanted to see, well, what would happen if you had just, if you just looked at the 0.6 millimeter diameter drops, if that's the only drop size you have. And you have a rather large fire here, 3.8 megawatts. So it's a, this large uh, heat relief zone is simulating a, a large, a tall flames. And um, basically, the, the momentum of the plume blows these small droplets out of the way, and they land outside the fire. So um, those droplets are not going to be very good for stopping, for suppressing the fire, controlling the fire. And um, so you, you, if you were measuring the water flux here, you'd have a big peak in water flux at this radial position. And, um, the, uh, these are the streamlines. The streamlines that are being drawn into the fire plume, being entrained by the fire plume, um, there's um, a, a recirculation cell here. As the momentum from these small droplets um, forces a, a downward flow here in one place, an upward flow here, so you get this, this recirculation cell which then deflects the incoming flow. And anyway, you get this funny looking pattern here uh, because of this recirculation cell. cell Due to the force of the droplets down here. So, um, anyway, this is an interesting result, and um, you can get this similar thing with the. Um, what happened? Good. Okay, you can get the same kind of thing with a. Uh, Isotherms. Um, and you see here the, uh, the gas temperature inside the plume here um, is uh, 1126 K, um, like eight, 800 degrees C or something like that, a little more than 800 eight or 900 degrees C, which is pretty realistic actually for a flame temperature. So the, the temperatures are not far off inside this fire source. And um, so you can see how the, 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 you have cooling due to the spray. And of course, that cooling due to the spray um, reduces the, temp the ceiling jet temperature out here, makes it less likely that additional spray devices would be activated. And um, uh, so that's one of the mechanisms whereby you can limit the number of sprinklers that are activated because of the cooling that occurs of the fire flow. Um, and another mechanism is to kind of have the sprinkler pump, actually force the spray pump mass out of the ceiling jet. 
and uh, that thins the ceiling jet. And it's a, another mechanism for reducing the number of sprinklers that are activated. You want to make sure that there are not too many sprinklers activated far away from the fire. You want them all to be activated close to the fire. So anyway, that was the motivation for doing those calculations. And we also looked at what would happen if you had large drop, one millimeter drops, and a very weak fire, a half megawatt fire. And you get this funny patterns here, and I don't know if there's any uh, reality here at all. But in any case, we see this funny streamlined patterns where you have two uh, recirculation cell here. Because of the strong uh, thrust momentum of the spray, you have a downward flow. At, um, you have a downward flow here, forming this recirculation cell. And, um, and uh, so the plume, the upward plume flow is deflected. It doesn't get anywhere near the ceiling here. And it only gets to the ceiling you know, far, farther away. And you have another recirculation cell here because of the droplet force. And so you get all these deflections of the streamlines. And you get all this fun <coughs> stuff going on. But basically, you would get water uh, flux or agent flux right into the fire. And so shouldn't have any problem controlling a fire of that size. So basically, you want to see if, what is the critical fire size at which um, above that fire size, you would not get control anymore due to the sprinkler spray. And below that, you, would get, you could control and suppress the fire. That was the objective. And um, so the results of a number of calculations were tried to correlate. And actually, a, um, something like this got published in Fire Safety Journal. And, <coughs> and um, uh, this is one of the types of correlations I was using. I was looking at this um, penetration ratio, which is, so for each of these data points, you had to do two calculations. One calculation you did without a fire to see how much water flux was arriving in the area near the fire source. And then another second calculation with the fire. And the ratio of the, um, of the two is, is what they plotted here. Um, how much, what fraction of the original water flow that was there without the fire gets through when you do have a fire. So that's what I was looking at. Of course, it can't be the one unity. And, um, and when this um, momentum ratio of the spray to the plume is very low, of course, you can get a lot of the water through. And this, the uh, drop size ratio here is calculated where the, the critical drop size is the drop size uh, diameter of the droplet that you release at the ceiling that would just free fall be able to penetrate through the plume uh, just due to gravity. Um, drops larger than that would fall through, smaller than that would be deflected by the plume. And I was just using uh, plume correlations to calculate both of those quantities, M sub P and E sub C. So those could all be calculated a priori once you know the, this heat release rate of 4 megawatts and the ceiling height. You could do those calculations, the plume momentum, the drop, critical drop size. And uh, so then the only thing varying here was the drop size of the spray. You could use a range of different drop sizes, mass medium drop size for the spray if you were using a distribution of drop sizes, and the momentum of the, uh, and the, momentum of the spray based on the injection velocity and the trajectory angles that we can look through here. So we're trying to get a correlation here. And you can see um, for different cell sizes, computational cell sizes, here's 20 by 20 and here's 38 by 38. And, um, they aren't too different. So we had some confidence that that was valid. But then, um, of course, trying to compare that with experimental data is very difficult. Um, it's very hard to, um, to uh, make these measurements at a full scale. And so we had kind of questionable success in doing that. But I was really trying to um, inspire people to, um, to do some more of those calculations. And, um, and it took well into the 1990s uh, before more of those calculations were done. Certainly by the time FDS finally came out and incorporated the drop sprays in FDS, that was uh, routine, routinely done, but that took a very long time. So um, that was a little, uh, it was too bad that it took so long for those calculations to happen. OK, and the last thing I want to talk about, oh, what am I doing for time? Okay. So 
um, is uh, now that you, uh, you, from the sealing jet formulas, you can determine when the first uh, spray is going to be activated. And then from the more complicated CFD calculation, you can determine uh, what the total interaction is, um, how much uh, of the water is going to get, get to the vicinity of the fire, and how many devices are going to be activated ultimately. But now you have to know, well, what is it enough of water once that uh, flux gets, once that water gets to the seat of the fire, will it be enough to suppress the fire? And one way of measuring that is to measure the flame heat flux within the fuel array and see what that characteristic flame heat flux is, and then assume that if you can get enough water, amount of water that can absorb that amount of heat flux, that that will be enough to suppress the fire. And that's just an assumption. And um, I learned from, uh, from Yibbing Zin that uh, maybe that's not the best assumption when you get to practical fuel arrays, but still it's, it's a working assumption and uh, we'll assume that uh, someday that we can make that work. But anyway, so our objective was to measure the plane heat flux within this burning fuel array, which in itself is, is a, a challenge. And, um, and perhaps we'd be able to do that in a single fire test. So you wouldn't need multiple fire tests to determine what's the critical amount of water flux that will suppress the fire. You could do that in one fire test. Um, now, since most uh, the dangerous fuel arrays involve vertical fuel, uh, flues, where you can have upward spread of the flu, and radiative reinforcement, um, that's the, the um, kind of the scenario we want to look at. And we need a rugged measurement instrument to, uh, to measure the, the heat flux in that flu. And um, so we developed a, a, um, a pipe a heat flux pipe that's very rugged and can measure the heat flux at a number of places in the flue, and I'll show you that. And as a kind of a prototype of that fire scenario, fire scenario, we can use a, um, a vertical parallel panel apparatus um, to represent the essential element of flue, basically two uh, parallel panels, and, um, and I'll show you that. So that's the, uh, the prototype and, the, uh, and the, the exposure at the base of those panels is a sand burner that you can vary from 30 to 100 or whatever you want uh, kilowatts to vary the, the exposure. So this is the um, schematic of the apparatus that was used at that time. This is in the uh, 2001 to the time frame. And uh, we have a these are the, the, the uh, plywood panels, and on top of that, you can put your specimen, whatever it is, the, if it's a plastic or a fiberglass reinforced polyester or whatever, you're testing. And here's the sand burner down here to get kind of a uniform flame exposure. And uh, you can vary this depending on what you're trying to uh, model. And, uh, and uh, the flames typically will be about, um, about 0.6 meters high there, thereabouts. So um, <coughs> flames the, from the exposure fire are a very small fraction of the total panel height. And it's obvious when you get a, the fire runs away uh, due to radiative reinforcement and, and propagates on its own out to the top. So it's very clear uh, when the, the fuel is um, self-propagating or not. And then that's the situation where you want to measure, this is, you can imagine as part of a flu in a, in a storage array. Um, that's the area where you want to measure the flame heat flux, and you have to be able to put an instrument in there without disturbing the surface of the fuel, and you're opening to make the fuel is going to disturb fuel and perhaps um, um, negating the results that you have from the, from the flame spray. So, um, this is a, a really um, a more <coughs> rigorous exposure than you have in the, in the uh, single burning item test or uh, anything. I guess anything is a more severe exposure than the single burning item test, so uh, it's just an editorial comment. Um, okay. So we'll, what we wanted to stick in there was a, a pipe, a heat flux pipe. And it's just a, a, a pipe, a water pipe. Um, 
And inside the pipe, we have this uh, 22 millimeter diameter pipe. We want it small enough so there's not too big a disturbance um, of a disturbance to the flow um, because we have uh, 600 millimeter, 300 millimeter uh, separation uh, between the panels. And um, we have, uh, we want to prevent any boiling, of course, of the water cooling in that pipe. And so for the maximum expected heat flux of 100 kilowatts per meter squared, uh, based on that, you need it at least eight meters per minute to, uh, to get a reasonable temperature difference and prevent boiling. And the temperature uh, elevation we're shooting for is 40 centigrade degrees um, as the maximum increase in temperature. And so you will get that with 100 kilowatts per square meter and eight meters per minute. And anyway, that's did a lot of calculations there. Um, you also want a, um, a fully turbulent flow that will, um, you'll be certain will um, cause thermocouples that are in the pipe to respond very quickly to any flame heat flux. And in order to do that, all of the flow is forced to be in an annulus. And we actually, inspired by DNA, uh, we use the double helix uh, in this annulus. Um, so we have, we have a, uh, a solid mass of uh, aluminum inside the pipe that has machined into a double helix groove. And uh, the, the contour of that groove was calculated so we had fully turbulent flow and uh, the thermocouples are, there were six thermocouples evenly spaced that were um, put into that, that groove also along with the water flow. And um, so, Doing that, we, we calculated that the system response time was about seven seconds. So that's, that's reasonable. Um, so all this had to be uh, you know, optimized and designed um, to get the right water from all the return to the flow, still with a reasonable pressure difference. And we ended up that, um, I believe, we forgot about the, uh, the obstruction of the flow by the thermocouples themselves. And so you needed a tremendous pressure to cause the flow that you needed. So, I think a later design corrected that. So this is the, the pipe. And actually, this thing was patented. Um, and uh, because of my name starts with A, it's the first name on the patent. So that was, that was fun. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I'm sure FM does not want to make any, any money on this. They, uh, they would love to have other people use it. So um, I think if you contacted FM, they would love to have this in your laboratory. So here's the, the sand burner exposure to these two panels, and you have this pipe, and um, and the uh, you have an electronic <coughs> flow meter here to measure the, the water flow coming in or out or whatever. Yeah, water flow goes in here and um, and goes out here, and so you you measure the, the delta T with thermocouples inside um, as a function of distance measure the water flow rate, so you can infer the flame heat flux that's in, in this flue. And, and basically, that's what you want. That's the, um, and for various different types of materials. So that would tell you what water flow, what sprinkler flow you need that would arrive in the fuel array. And uh, so, so summarizing some of the work that I did um, at FM over the years, um, since the early 70s, <coughs> using the, the uh, ceiling jet formula, formulas, it's been possible to predict uh, when devices near the ceiling would be activated. And then, beginning in the 80s, you could do that spray plume interaction and predict uh, how much of the agent flow would actually arrive near the fire. And, um, and then, uh, finally, um, in the 2000s, been able to predict uh, from a single fire test the, the minimum agent flux that you need for fire suppression. So uh, thank you very much. It's really an honor to have been uh, selected to, to give this talk. I, I appreciate it deeply. Uh, thank you. <laughs>